Thank you guys all for being here. We were so stressed because the, the guest list was for 60. And the numbers kept going up and people kept DMing us saying like, can we come? Can I come through? So it's so nice to see such a full house and that we're not squashed in here. Um, thank you for being here tonight. My name is Tammy Langtree and I work through the LAPA space, which is technically the space behind you, as well as a resident apartment upstairs. Um, LAPA is funded and co-conceptualized by the Goethe Institute. Um, it's, I, I use it and work with it as a many meaning word, um, a way of thinking about artistic practice as homing and homing as artistic practice. Uh, we do workshops, um, programs, very specifically residencies, um, and we're so excited to inaugurate another series of residencies from September. Uh, but I won't talk too much about that at the moment because we're really excited to work with and to keep working with race, gender, class, RGC. Um, so I wanna say thank you to Victoria, to James, to Danny, and to the others who work through this project. Um, and really excited and thank you to have Mindy here. So thank you to, to bring this index to us. Thank you to Natalie for joining this index tonight. Thank you to Nombuso, um, who you will all hear more of their practices as we go through this evening. Um, my job is really just to introduce myself and Lapa, and then I will hand over to Danny, who's gonna take us through the program tonight and kind of walk with us through the different presentations. Um, so again, thank you to you guys for bringing this project to us as Lapa, um, and thank you for you guys to join tonight. Yeah, Woo. thanks Danny. Hi everyone. Um, this uh, gathering tonight has been the result of months of work and of conversations and we're just so glad that it's so well received and so well attended and that there's an appetite and an audience for this kind of really uh, important work. I had the opportunity to see uh, Mindy Sue um, give this performed reading a few months ago in California and it is extraordinary and supporting a very ambitious and outstanding project. Um, to give you just um, some orientation, I'm sure you've seen the snacks down there, the bathrooms are just behind you over there, and if you can put your uh, cell phones off as we are, we are recording this. Um, and then for a flow of the evening, we've already been grounded in uh, Nombuso Matabela's uh, sonic practice, and we will be getting more of that later um, in the, the theme of sayings that we've been saying. Um, maybe tonight is less book launch, more performance. Um, thinking about a way to be in a different kind of dialogue with the work um, that has been offered to us, which is also available outside, kindly by Jonathan Ball, so you will be able to buy the book. Um, and in terms of flow of evening, we will have a performance by the wonderful Natalie Paneng. You can also look at Natalie's work um, in both of these two rooms in Lapa, and thank you uh, to Lapa for really being a home this place has really um, offered us uh, a home to settle into. Um, and after Natalie's performance, we will have a break where you can get some drinks um, and some refreshments and just have a breath to take it in before we'll go into Mindy Sue's performed reading, which will be followed by a abbreviated short Q&A. Um, we'd really like to encourage a flow of conversation in the social aspect of the evening. Um, so Mindy will be around, Natalie will be around for you to be in dialogue with them. So to locate you in uh, the Cyber Feminist Index, um, it is somewhat of an encyclopedia of an indexing, of an archive, and of a, a troubling even of the idea of what an index means. It's a work of remarkable collaboration, which we'll go into a little bit more. Um, it's a work that started as a spreadsheet, 
Um, so this is how far Excel can take you. Um, and that has become not only a book of over a thousand entries that were crowdsourced and moderated, but an ongoing platform. And this gathering is really one of the spaces to um, extend this index to invite further submissions from here and to think the cyber feminist index from here. Um, so in that spirit and um, in terms of introductions and dialogues, when uh, Mindy approached us, there was no one else that I could think that could be in this kind of conversation in a more perfect way than, than Natalie Paneng's artwork and Natalie Paneng's universe, which you get a chance to get a, a sense of, of tonight. Um, and in terms of introductions, uh, Natalie Paneng is a world builder and sees her growing practice as a way to navigate, share, and archive imagined and alternative realities brought to life through digital artistic practice. So I'm gonna hand over to Natalie. So, um, as Danny has contextualized what I'll be doing here um, as a performance, I would like to recontextualize it um, as a stream of consciousness, as an awkward girl's bubble babble in front of people, so many <laughs> eyes, and um, just share that like, it's really vulnerable and I just feel really like I'm always embarrassing myself through my practice and always like opening up my soul and my mind to people. And um, there's no other way to do it, but unfortunately that is exactly what I'm gonna be doing tonight. So I hope that we can do it together and I hope there's space for that. And I'm also gonna like ask you to have some energy during this situation um, because we will be playing a game. And it always sucks when people say like, can I get a yeah? And people are like, yeah. So if you can, even if it's like five people who have that energy tonight, please, please play this game with me. Um, so cool, I'm gonna start now. Hi everybody, my name is Natalie Paneng and <laughs> I am a new media artist. I'm actually a multidisciplinary artist working within new media and world building, creating installations. Um, I see myself as a universe builder, both IRL and online. And so I always try create this connection between giving people experiences through the screen and then giving people experiences in real life and kind of blurring the lines of always like making people jump into like a little portal through these devices. So what I'm actually gonna be doing tonight is I'm packing what Natalie Banning is and what Nat Natalie Banning is not. Um, because I just, I find it so hard to speak about or to contextualize the practice in a very well-articulated academic way. Um, I'm very like free and I use my practice to understand this. And so I think I'm not at the point of necessarily articulating things in words. I'm still very much a feeler, a performer, a thinker, a doer. And as I come to the space, I am just going to do that in the best way I can um, and kind of be vulnerable and manifest what I am to myself in front of people um, and figure out like what's happened in the journey and like what I hope to bring forward and what I hope people reflect who do the same thing or are just like in the space can like we can have moments of reflection, you know, um, just by focusing on myself. Uh, my practice is very, I say the word self-centered, not like self-centered, but self-centered. Uh, meaning that I am the center of the practice, I'm the thinker, I'm the doer, I'm the performer, I'm the presence um, within the work. And this is because I'm trying to find ways to interrogate both myself and environment. Um, so I'm always creating alternative ca characters. So as I say, like, what is Natalie Banning? most of the time the characters within the work are not Natalie Banning. You know, like Natalie Banning is the artist and the presenter, 
but she is not the person in the frame. She is not the person in the landscapes. And so I'm using her, like I'm using Natalie. And I also question, am I Natalie Fanning? You know, so it's like, it feels weird to say my name while I talk about this because it, it really feels like an abstract concept and in some ways it is, but in some ways I have to pull myself closer to myself and be like, well, it is me. And so I'm just going to unpack what that is with you with a little game. But before I do that, I'm going to speak about, I'm going to kind of mind map um, what I meant about both IRL and online. And so here I've just like tried to break down my practice to those who don't know me and um, kind of show how I play between installation and world building, always making very immersive landscapes that people can insert themselves in and within these landscapes can watch happenings within the screen of other alternative landscapes with alternative characters and versions of me um, navigating, interrogating, playing, existing, usually resting, usually pointing, usually doing very like flat actions because I also just don't want to like overexert the babies. Um, I just want them to exist. And that's actually what it is. It's like the existence of the characters in order to populate the universe with multiple versions of the world, but also populate the universe with multiple characters. And um, for now, it's populating the universes with myself or these characters, um, but also it's kind of an invitation for people to see themselves in the work in two ways and to see themselves in alternative landscapes, but also to see themselves as invited into these worlds that are very like abstract, soft and safe, um, as well as seeing themselves as artists who can be self-centered and like use themselves as a source to create worlds, populations, thoughts, feelings. Welcome to Nightotopia, a video simulation utopia created for Natalie Penang by Natalie Penang. Nysotopia is based on creating a digital utopia and engaging as the main character who inhabits this utopian simulation. The video explores ideas of reconfiguring space as well as reconfiguring oneself. Using the idea of play and simulation games, I inhabit a digital dream space created by me for characters like me. The character is informed by me and exists as a digital interpretation of what kind of form my digital self would embody. The space in which the character exists is within a screen, she plays and waits for interaction. She enjoys showing off her mobility as well as human-like emotion and motion abilities taking much of her physical cues from Sims. Nysotopia is linked to my personal detachment from social media and became a way for me to exist and play in another digital space created by me with less of the restrictions and pressures we face from existing digitally and online ultimately, giving me freedom to play as well as speculate alternative realities and characters which is a big part of my practice. She sits, stands, jumps, laughs, cries, and naps. She explores and plays in her customized utopia, inspiring me and hopefully you to find your own personal utopia. We have some control when creating our utopias. We deserve to experience our utopias and to have some fear of control in the simulations we are placed in. Control here is freedom and agency. Through investigative play, we can get closer to nice utopias and simulation. It is nice there, very nice. Come to Nysotopia, you are always welcome here. It is very nice. It is lovely and nice here. So beautiful and inspiring. Our I like it here. It is very nice. So nice and beautiful. Wow oh wow. I'm a nice girl in a nice world. Ah, oh, finally, I have some peace here in my corner of my customized digital simulation. I have found the green promised land and it is nice utopia. It is so nice here, so very, very, very nice. So, so nice, ah, oh, this is nice. Come to nice utopia, it is so nice here. You are always welcome to share this simulation with me. Cool. 
And so this is what I was talking about. Um, so before I spoke about creating worlds IRL, and that's like basically through installation. I didn't actually talk about that, but basically made through installation and fabrication. And a lot of the fabrication either has like digital thinking, um, and that's either through 3D printing or like computer generated work, and then trying to find a way to make that tangible and then trying to find a way to make that tangible because I think for a long time when I was making work um, and speaking about being a digital artist, it was so hard to like extend from just the screen and make people understand why it matters to be a digital artist. And so I tried to find ways to, oh, it's a me thing, sorry. Um, so I try to find ways to make it tangible so that the digital can be like in people's hands and in people's homes and not only on screens and so it like jumps out. But I've obviously continued with the digital practice like within the screen and um, yeah, so using like projection, playing with like I said, like characters and like using the computer to have me have like a million versions of the same character in one frame. Um, um, moving from this idea of Nightotopia into like VR now because it's like how do I take this idea, this like cute funny video simulation video which is very flat and actually give people a chance to step into the frame beyond the feeling or the joke of a utopia. And so my practice is also centered around like this constant extension of like the first idea. So like the first idea is that like I want safety. And then the second idea is that like, okay, I find so much safety just being close to my computer and like feeding it and it feeding me. And then working like behind the camera and bringing it back into the computer and then bringing all those characters and populating worlds and then that moving from a video idea into a genuine world that will be experienced soon, hopefully. Um, so now the game. Um, so pink means hmm. So pink means hmm. And green means hmm, you know? So like, I mean, there's points where I would love us to hmm and hmm, you know, just so that it feels like we're having um, a, a brain chat. Because um, <laughs> I think, you know, we're here for cyber feminism and that's a really big chat. So I really wanted to bring clear, articulated thoughts to the space. So I just wanted to make sure we know how to play the game. So, hmm, hmm, guys. Hmm, oh, you don't know how, we're going from the first, the first thought, and then, and then. Okay, so, hmm, hmm, hmm. And that is gamification, guys. <laughs> that is what you call gamifying an experience. Um, and now we are playing a game called, sorry, I'm gonna do it again. And now for the real game and performance. Welcome to, welcome to C, 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 Rio. Scenario is a game that I made today. Uh, basically, I give you a scene, a scenario, and tell you a situation. I'm so sorry, Mindy, I'm such a hand like person. I give you a scene, and this scene basically unpacks elements uh, about my practice that have been brought to me through conversation and dialogue with other artists or in art spaces. And these are reflections that I am actually trying to figure out, and I thought what better way to figure them out than to present them in front of a bunch of people and kind of feel if I'm like off or on, um, but also kind of like, yeah, let's just vibe. I'm gonna play the first scenario. 
And the first scenario is a... Exactly. That's how I felt. Scenario one. Oh, oh, hey, Natalie. Oh my gosh, I just saw your work and I literally had this thought, you know. I looked at it and I was really into how, you know, you are um, basically internet-based, performing online, thinking about, you know, micro genres such as Vaporwave. And I thought, who does this remind me of? Who does this remind me of? And I remembered the babe who started it all, the Tumblr babe who started it all, the babe who was using MySpace and all these online platforms to perform. Um, what's her name again? Ah, yes, Molly Soda. Do you know her? You're just like Molly Soda. Have you ever heard that before? Molly Soda, I actually have a little like blurb about her so I just don't like mess it up. Molly Soda is a Brooklyn based artist um, and she's basically post internet. Um, she's an internet performance artist working with self concept, contemporary feminism and cyber feminism, um, born in 18, 1989 and her real name is Amelia Soto. So. I mean, when this question was brought into my sphere, I was totally like, yeah, she's really cool. And I think she is super cool. And I had to kind of think about, first of all, I didn't um, know Molly Soda that much, like during the beginning of the, cre day, the creation of my practice. Um, but I later realized that she is like a really big deal within the work I'm doing and she's actually somebody who I should be like looking to within the creation of practices like myself. Um, and I was trying to figure out like why, even though she's someone I can aspire to and feel super connected with, why it didn't sit right that this person was asking me how Molly Soda and Natalie Baneng are possibly and definitely the same thing and cannot be separated. Um, and I started like going into her work and I realized the differences and the intersections are basically that Molly Soda exists within performing her real life online for people to reflect and see themselves within the frame. And I found the difference to kind of be that I perform online in alternative, non-real spaces as a black woman, um, trying to bring black women into spaces where they don't think they can imagine. And I think so the, it's, the, it's the idea of the imaginary versus the IRL and the presentation of those two things. Um, and so I don't know, like it's definitely a hmm, because it's, am I right, am I wrong? Should I be closer to the idea of seeing the, be the beauty in the connection or should I be making harder lines and harder separations and taking up more space and trying to speak more about the context that I'm from because also post-internet is not necessarily what an artist like me is from because I'm like post-post. I'm like, I'm Instagram. I'm, and I'm late Tumblr, and I'm be, like, what was the, 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 the Blackberry internet? Um, but the one that you bought, the 60 Rand, and then you, BIS, you know? And it's like, before BIS, I hardly had internet access in that way. And pre-BIS, it was like a pair of mini, which was like a world of internet. And so it's like, what is the difference between an artist who's had, who can speak post-internet through having access to the internet versus an artist who is post that kind of access, um, finding and navigating themselves online and then trying to DIY aesthetics that already, like within their context, is DIY aesthetics. Um, so that's my first scenario, the hmm, hmm. But is it a hmm or is it a hmm? It's a hmm. OK. 
Okay, next scenario. I mean, I think these are, so I'm also like very much like these hmms and hmms are like very soft hmm and hmms. I'm really like also looking to share myself and my thoughts and my like um, very biased ideas about things because it's my practice versus another practice. But this is not all practice based. Um, but I think also what I'm doing here is just sharing the life of and the thoughts of a new media artist navigating something, not in articulation, but more in the practice of making, creating, and then being given opportunities to come talk about it. And it's like, why do you think I'm ready? So this is just like, a, it's a practice for the practice and for the existence of a practice like mine. Scenario two. Ah, oh, Natalie, so lovely to see you. Yes, uh, I am, I am your um, Western gallery representative. Anyway, yes, we were actually thinking, Natalie, um, we love your work, you know, and we have so many collectors here in the West, and we really, really want them to buy your work, you know. But the problem currently is that, you know, you're there, you know? And I, I mean, I have no clue, but I would just assume that they do not want to see you, you know, there every morning when they wake up in their cute uh, apartments. So we have the big euros for you, but how about, like, just think about it, just consider it, you know? We don't want to change anything about your practice, but we thought, how about considering taking yourself out the frame? How about just making landscapes? No, Natalie. And you know, at least you're present in the landscape, but you're not actually in the artwork. You know, we don't want to change your practice. We, we love you. We love your work and we love you. But think about it. Mm. <laughs> um, yes, like another question. It's another hmm. And this is hypothetical. Um, and the, the thing I'm wondering about is also that, like, what is the point of a practice like this if the black female artist is taken out the frame trying to do this very specific work just so people can enjoy the landscape? And it's like, go on a tour, go have a holiday if you want to see, like, beautiful landscapes. And why try change... <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I just I, <laughs> um, I don't mean it like super literally, but I also mean it in this way of like a landscape is nothing without like what it inhabits and what it aims to like um, feed and what it aims to protect, you know. And I feel like this work is also very much like placing like if I take myself out, I take so many young black girls out the frame and I just give a landscape. And a landscape is very hard to place, um, place into a context beyond just like the actual context. Like just it being context, there needs to be a story, there needs to be an existence, there needs to be a safety net that that space generates and holds. So this is another question that I'm kind of like playing with in my practice. And I forgot what you guys said. Is it a hmm or a hmm? It's a hmm. Okay, good to know. Um, okay, and scene number, scenario number three. Three. Oh, scenario three. Ah, Natalie, you know, I've been doing some reading, you know, on all these things, and, you know, I've really been really into, like, glitch feminism and cyber feminism. Have you ever heard about it? It's super cool. You should read this book. It's an index by Mindy Sue. Anyway, um, babe, have you ever positioned yourself better? You know, like, I've been thinking about your positioning, and it's a bit too, like, in the air, ethereal, like, you're, like, navigating it a little too much. How about just... Think about it, think about it. Afrofuturism. You know, your work is African, your work has technology, and so, boom, Afrofuturism.
You know what I'm saying? is tricky so I'm gonna be careful because while when I made it I was definitely and yesterday I also had a moment to Danny and I was just like I am not Afrofuturism and I've always said like I am not um, and I've also been wondering if that's a safe statement um, and I looked it up a little more because I think after we spoke about this, like I've just been talking to Danny and like everyone of and Tammy about like Afrofuturism and wondering if I should be like positioning myself in this way or saying these things live on platforms on microphones, and um, but I thought like maybe it's not like like I said like these questions are through me as an artist, but I think that these questions are questions that can be reflected on any artist. And so I'm just like using myself as the Popeye who's like literally opening up herself and her heart and her practice in front of people. But I think that they're also like really important questions for artists who are digital, um, making work at this time where everything is digital. I mean, I feel like it's so dangerous because even if you just like make NFTs about love, they might still call you an Afrofuturist <laughs> just because you're African and making digital art and it's technology. And so it's just the side <laughs> question like, <laughs> My questions are just more based on like how safe is it to just immediately like try stop an artist from not um, framing themselves within a certain genre, especially if they're still practicing and figuring it out and placing them into Afrofuturistic like context. Um, and yeah, like I said, like in the beginning, I was very like, I am not, but then I went on to Wikipedia you guys know Wikipedia? Yeah. <laughs> and I kind of research like, what do they think it is? Or like, how are they teaching other children what Afrofuturism <laughs> is? And um, they basically like summarized it as, well, I'm summarizing what they said as it's a cultural aesthetic, um, a philosophy of science, history, intersections of African diasporic culture with science and technology, and kind of went down into speaking about like speculative fiction, technoculture, fantasy, and alternative history. And I've said alternative a lot. I said, and I said fantasy, I didn't say fantasy, but I said utopia, and for me, utopia and fantasy are very linked. And so now I'm like, hmm, is it a hmm or a hmm? I really can't tell, but I'm also, I think that I realized while working on this that maybe I am not anti-Afrofuturism, um, but maybe I am more like trying to figure out what are the niche um, streams within this and like how do I how do I accept it and reject it in a way that allows people to understand exactly which world or which universe this kind of practice falls within Afrofuturism? Um, and also how do I accept it? Because it's just such a scary um, it's such a scary label to have like your practice thrown into because it feels like a very specific path. Um, so I think. Through this, I'm kind of dealing with the acceptance that I'm possibly um, seen and understood within the context of Afrofuturism, and it's okay, and I understand it. And like through the practice, I can get more understanding of like where my universe lies within this, and know that like the universe is safe, it's big, and actually like you have to turn left and turn right to find my place, you know without rejecting it. And I think it's also not good or safe to, as an African artist, trying to open up space, reject something that tries to make space for so many practices within this. So, is it a hmm or is it a hmm? Mm. It's a hmm. Um, and then something is missing here that was basically just saying that, um, these are all hypothetical situations and no humans or no, nothing was harmed in the sharing of these scenarios. Um, and yeah, I'm, I think I'm gonna close off very soon in this dot, dot, dot. Um, 
it was really cool to kind of just share some of the things that are like at the very top of my head as a digital artist, as somebody like navigating and as somebody who is very practice driven. And I really, really, really love the word practice for us digital artists, so like for us artists, because it's definitely a word that allows for failure, for expansion, for figuring out, for messing it up, for saying blah, 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 for being right at one point and wrong at another, for navigating it through execution and not necessarily words. And I hope that my practice is something that does that. And I think that I find my practice to be more successful through the execution of it rather than the articulation of it. But I'm really hoping that soon I'll be able to articulate in like a super like blah, 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 blah way that makes sense to people who understand blah, blah, blah. Um, but for now, I'm just gonna make my work and invite people in into the space and work with the asset that I'm really interested in, which is like feeling and sense and like teleportation and using the art to do that. So my conclusion in the biggest words I could find for this presentation. <laughs> Um, so back to what is Natalie, but like what Natalie Banning is and what Natalie Banning is not. Natalie Banning is some identity politics through internet language and compu computer generated art. So, yeah, thank you so much for playing this cute game with me. Time for that. Yeah. Uh, Natalie also reminded me that I'm terrible at introducing myself. I always forget. So I'm Danny Bolan. I'm the resident curator at RGC. Um, and Natalie, you, you know, what you just did reminds me why I love this work. Because you, you gave us such a vulnerable, textured introduction to, to who you are as an artist and risky. You know, as a theater kid to theater kid, yes to the risk. Um, Mindy Su is a designer and researcher whose practice reimagines the history of the internet and how this might, gu might guide its future. She teaches these alternative web-based practices at Rutgers University and Yale, U Yale University. Um, and we are in for a really big treat, so please join me in welcoming Mindy. Uh, first of all, thank you so much to LAPA for hosting us. Um, it's really exciting to be here by invitation and a lot of planning from Danny and James, Victoria, Tammy, really appreciate all of the work. And also to be in conversation, our works and later during the Q&A with Natalie. And hopefully we'll be able to talk through some of those things uh, through the things I'll talk about in this presentation as well. All right. so. What you see in front of you is the Cyber Feminism Index. This book is a source book, it's a chronology that's annotated, and it's also a collection of online activism and net art from the past three decades. It's also structured as an index of indexes. So I'll kind of walk you through what that means as well. But before kind of getting into the structure and contents of the book, we might ask, what is cyber feminism? So this term historically has been left pretty undefined. Some of the early uh, groups didn't give it a concise definition to allow for the constant mutation of the term. So if you were to ask me what this means, I would start by breaking apart the word itself. So this prefix cyber first emerged in uh, Norbert Wiener's cybernetics of the 1940s. People familiar with this field of study? So in the most simple one-liner, cybernetics proposes that not only do you impact a system, that system is also impacting you. So you're in this constant <coughs> feedback loop of inputs and outputs of behavioral change, et cetera. This might happen and working with new tech. We'll let the, get this camera to focus. 
Um, cyber then appeared in cyberspace in Willie Gibson's novel, uh, Neuromancer from the 1980s. Have people read this science fiction novel? So Gibson's cyberspace was important for a lot of reasons. It kind of predicted the sensory networked online landscapes that are very much in discussion today. Think the metaverse, virtual reality, et cetera. But his cyberspace was also very characterized by the male gaze. So you have fembots, cyber babes, depictions of women in robotic or assistant-like roles. So when cyber was then fixed to feminism, this was done by two distinct parties unbeknownst to the other. The first was the British cultural theorist Sadie Plant, and the second was the Australian art collective VNS Matrix. When they put these two disparate word parts together, it was almost an oxymoron. They meant it as a joke. It was supposed to be a provocation. So how could feminists or women or marginalized communities shape what cyberspace might be? And we see a lot of examples in this book that seem to be a bit at odds with each other, uh, but really show the rhizomatic, constantly mutating definition of this space. The sticker itself comes from the webpage of the Old Boys Network. So this was a 1990 cyber feminist collective from the page of Helene von Oldenburg, in which she asked the public about what they thought cyber feminism might be. And according to this pie chart, it was met with a lot of confusion and conflicting answers. But again, instead of correcting and giving a concise definition of the term, they instead wrote the 100 antitheses. This was a manifesto where they listed 100 definitions as to what cyber feminism was not in poetic and multilingual descriptions. So ultimately, the Old Boys Networks leaves cyber feminism undefined in order for it to be more inclusive and adaptable. And we'll see a lot of variations of that term here. This book is also the edited hard copy of a soft copy. Cyberfeminismindex.com. So this website came out in 2020. It was made in collaboration with and developed by Angeline Meitzler, Charles Briskowski, Janine Rosen, and it serves as the living complement to this book. So when we see a website, we typically assume that they're mutable, ephemeral, and oftentimes less authoritative than printed books. Printed books are seen as immutable, uh, legitimizing, et cetera. But we're here trying to kind of flip that on its head. So I'll talk about the website a bit more later. But ultimately, this is the site that will live on in perpetuity. We've made a lot of decisions in the design and the uh, production, the coding, that will give it as much posterity as possible. But the book then acts as a snapshot of a moment of the website's mutation. So you can actually buy a book in the back today, but in theory, you could also go to the site, select your own entries, which will be added to this side panel trail, and then print out your own reader or download your own PDF and create snapshots of your own. So more on that to come. This book is also an interface filled with hyperlinks. So typically we hear hyperlinks and it has a digital connotation, but many of its precursors were analog. So here in each of the entries, you'll see these green pills. There's one to three in each of the texts. Analog precursors might be seen as cross-references, indexes, bibliographies, footnotes, all have been being cited as early examples and inspirations for the hyperlink. So in entry 146, Cyberfeminism, Connectivity, Critique, and Creativity from 1999, in their editor's notes, Renata Klein and Susan Hawthorne call uh, their cross-reference a hypertextual link. And then throughout the book's pages and the margins, you have this eye icon that pushes and pulls you to different parts of the book in a nonlinear fashion. So this book will also do that in the same way. Hyperlinks or cross-references ultimately show that nothing is isolated. 
All knowledge, all art, all production is made in collaboration with and association to things that came before us, things that are uh, in present day, but also what you want people to do with the work that you're making now. So if you were to follow a path of cross-references in this book, that hyperlink learning trail might read something like this. Cyberfeminism is a mutating word with a nebulous history. Its evolution is less a single root system with multiple branches than a network of entangled rhizomes, constantly and multidirectionally moving. Virginia Barrett of the Australian art collective VNS Matrix has described cyberfeminism as anti-genealogical, anti-authorial, and a hostile mucus, never faithful to any origins. Cross-reference eight. I should also give a heads up that there are some language and images in this presentation that might be perceived as inappropriate, so just a heads up since we have some young people in the room. Okay, eight, VNS Matrix, 1991. The most consistent VNS Matrix Genesis story is that VNS Matrix crawled out of the cyber swamp in the particularly hot summer of 1991 and via an aesthetics of slime initially generated as porn by women for women. VNS Matrix forged an unholy alliance with technology and its machines and spewed forth a blasphemous text which was the birth of cyberfeminism. VNS Matrix was on a mission to hijack the toys from techno cowboys and remap cyberculture with a feminist bent. This is one story. There are also stories about a slime consciousness operating via spiral space. Cross-reference 181. One eighty one tales from the puppet mistress, Gash Girl. Years after losing my machine virginity to a Mac five one two K, I have slipped through the reality grid into the clear violent haze of spiral space. Desire, I slide through the luminous screen to inhabit the spaces between words. The keyboard is constantly sticky. Madness. An erotically reconstructed a replicant, my biocode is being rewritten. This is better than any drug. Cross-reference 646. Six forty six, Discortes Adora, Ripper. Mestiza of the Southern Pussy, meat of a pussy that expels word vomit, conserved by death and disgust of the colonization representing an ancestral systemic violation in live meat. I do not feel pride because I was born full of prejudices. No man's land. Cross reference ninety five. Ninety-five, Confessions of a Webback, Guillermo Gomez Pena, and Evan Theus Shipstead, 1997. You call yourself a webback. Do you see yourself as an intruder on the net? Yes, the number of Latino students, artists, and activists on the net is minute. But we want to participate in the national and cultural debates, and many are permeated by technology. I consider myself a coyote, a smuggler of ideas. We want net inhabitants to get used to a new cultural sensibility, but we do encounter the linguistic border patrol. So as you can see, the index that we're primarily in now, what we call the main index, feels a bit like an encyclopedia. So if you flip through, similar to reading an encyclopedia, you likely wouldn't read it from cover to cover. You might open the book at random, find an entry that resonates with you, and then in this book you can find associations on the page or use these cross-references to hop to different parts. If you're looking for more of a guided tour, there's also collections where artists, activists, scholars, and collectives created a theme like indigenous futurism, and they then selected 10 to 20 entries from this book about that theme. So Scamanati is largely considered the first indigenous net artist and their collection will give you how they might navigate this book. 
If you're looking for something specifically, there's also the index of titles, as well as an index of people. But if you're looking for some more serendipitous discovery, there's also the index of images. All New Gen, VNS Matrix, 1992. Sabotage the databanks of Big Daddy Mainframe. Your guides through the contested zone are renegade DNA sluts. The most wicked is Circuit Boy, a dangerous techno bimbo. Be prepared to question your gendered construction. The Black Trans Archive, Danielle Brathwaite Shirley, 2020. Welcome to the pro-black, pro-trans archive. This interactive archive was made to store and center black trans people, to preserve our experiences, our thoughts, our feelings, our lives, to remember us even when we are at risk of being erased. So when you first enter this site, you have three options. The first is if you are black and trans, the second is if you're trans, and the third is if you're cis. And depending on your selection, you have access to a different type of content within this online space. Time Traveler, Scamonati, 2008. This is a website from the future Watch for upcoming episodes in which Hunter Deerhouse sails to Europe with Pocahontas in AD 1615, aids and abets the Dakota Sioux Uprising of 1862, and finds true love in the Kahnawake Mohawk Territory in 2009. So what you're seeing here is a machinima. A machinima is a portmanteau of machine and cinema. These were typically films or plays that happened within video games and then the recording became a video art piece. So you can watch all six episodes of Time Traveler on Skawanati's site. Or you can link to them from the Cyberfeminism Index. It's very sensitive to light, so we just gotta make it focus. Let's see if it scans. I'll walk you through how this scanning is working too, but actually if you see Natalie's video in the back, there's a frame that talks about the glitch, and I think that that's been a key component of a kind of embracing this bugginess. All right, Afro Cyber Resistance, Tabata Rezaire, 2014. We need to quickly snap out of the web 2.0 fantasy of the internet as a promised land. Whatever visions that ideologically shaped this technology at the beginning of the development of computers have now successfully been structurally organized to serve the primary interests of North American governmental bodies and the commercial interests of the world's wealthiest companies. The Bitch Mutant Manifesto, VNS Matrix, 1996. Your fingers probe my neural network. The tinkling sensation in the tips of your fingers are my synapses responding to your touch. It's not chemistry, it's electric. Don't ever stop fingering my separating holes, extending my oozing boundary. But in spiral space, there is no they, there is only us. Suck my code. Okay, we'll talk through a couple more of these and then we'll kind of go through the history of how this project has changed. Nahis has been very fickle too, so let's see if it scans. Okay, we're gonna skip. Yeah, there it is. Daddy Residency, Nahi Kim, 2019. I plan to have a baby after seven years by artificial insemination. 
And I'd like to have a variety of companions for that rigorous but invaluable parenting experience. So I'm launching this open call for daddy residents who want to raise the baby with me for a certain amount of time. The application deadline is July 31st, 2025. So you all have just under two years <laughs> to apply to be Nahi's baby daddy. Okay, last but not least, the Old Boys Network, 1997. The Old Boys Network is regarded as the first international cyber feminist alliance. Normally, the term Old Boys Network is used as a metaphor to describe an informal interrelation of men. Nowadays, the Old Boys Network may be used for a dangerous cyber feminist virus. So as you can see, there's a lot of different strands of this space across time from the past three decades, but also across regions. Um, and I kind of wanted to walk you through how we got to where, what we're looking at now. When I first began this process, I was essentially creating a bibliography. So I read our academic articles such as Donna Haraway's A Cyborg Manifesto, scraped the citations, and this was really valuable, but it also primarily cited Western and theories of technology and ecology. And was also, I was looking for much more practice-oriented things. Then I learned about the New Women's Survival Catalog. Have people heard of the Whole Earth Catalog? So the Whole Earth Catalog is seen as a proto-internet. Uh, tech giants like Steve Jobs calls this Google before Google. It's kind of become the Bible for a lot of tech CEOs in Silicon Valley. But the New Women's Survival Catalog was billed as the feminist Whole Earth Catalog. And yet, while the Whole Earth Catalog has a cult following, not many people have heard of the New Women's Survival Catalog, even though it was a best New York Times bestseller. It sold out in the first few months of production. Um, but there's a great facsimile out right now. The New Women Survival Catalog also started off as a bibliography. So Susan Rennie and Kirsten Grimstad were at Barnard. As they created this bibliography, their advisor told them that a revolution could never happen within an institution, that they had to go grassroots. So they got in a car, drove from New York to Los Angeles, and along the way collected feminist bookstores, aid for sexual assault survivors, tips on how to get a divorce, and they ended up with this compendium of second wave feminism in the US from that time. So my version of the road trip was the phone call. This was 2019, early, late 2018. I called friends who referred me to scholars, activists, artists, et cetera, and they in turn referred me to others. And that spider webbing effect became the foundation of this project. So one of the first people I spoke with was Judy Malloy who also made a compendium called Women, Art, and Technology from 2003 with MIT Press. So Judy Malloy gave me the terms yak and hack. This was her distinction between theory and practice. So yak is yak, 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 like talking. Hack is hacking or making, and how these two things cannot live without the other. We cannot lead only a theory-driven life, and these practice-oriented works can also be grounded in theory. So again, they're very entangled. So, as Danny mentioned, the first iteration of this bibliography was really a spreadsheet. So at the top in purple, you can see yak and hack. The blue are all of your categories. So this is like floss, free libre, open source software, AI, machine learning, hacktivism, et cetera. The green are all media types, like net artworks, uh, syllabi, hacker spaces, et cetera. But as you scroll through, even without seeing the date, title, or author, you'll see that things don't fit neatly into individual categories. This is something that Natalie was really interrogating publicly a few minutes ago. So because these things, a lot of the terms we were pulling came from pre-existing categories from academic journals, we kind of had to like slot things in to where they fit best, even if it wasn't a perfect match, but it completely removed our possibility for allowing for the blurriness in between categories 
or for the development of new taxonomic terms altogether. So we scratch the categories, which you will not find on the online website. However, before completely dismissing this categorical structure, um, when digital spreadsheets first came out, they were considered a liberatory technology. Anyone with access to a personal computer and a digital spreadsheet could start to do some fairly complex computations online. So they were considered functional programming for the masses. However, quote, Ted Nelson, who's considered the father of the concept of the hyperlink, wrote, conventional data structures, especially tables and arrays, like a spreadsheet, are confined structures. They're created from a rigid top-down specification that enforces regularity and rectangularity. So here, this was what he wrote when introducing his n-dimensional spreadsheet tool called ZigZag, which you can see in the frame. This isn't really about the promotion of an alternative tool, right? It's never really about the tool, it's about how you use it. But what's interesting about ZigZag is it essentially created a regular system that embraced the irregular. So here you have a two by three grid. You can select any cell and then add any number of cells in any direction to allow for this fluidity and embrace of quote unquote the irregular rather than confining things to the quote unquote rectangular. rectangular. So just a quick note that Ted Nelson coined a lot of works. I mentioned the hyperlink, rectangularity, but also things like teledildonic. Uh, so that's an example of that is this. This is a, the logo from buttplug.io. It looks like a squid, but the front is actually a butt plug and the tendrils are all different ports. <laughs> so different ways to connect to USBs and et cetera. All right, so the second container, the first was the spreadsheet, the second was a website. So Angeline and I were lucky in that we had a lot of references. We had all these websites from the 90s, many of them were now dead, which is called link rot. Many were still living. One of the ones that was living was this 100 antitheses, which I mentioned before, in the anti-definition of cyberfeminism. The URL has changed, but the website still works perfectly, and we can begin to guess why that is. So in 1997, Cornelia Solfrank hard-coded this website, which means it's coded in HTML and CSS, the backbones of the internet, without any dynamic scripting processes, such as JavaScript or Python. It's also using a lot of system defaults. It's using our HTML tags like h1, h2 list items, even drop downs, the, the form fields for the navigation, and also defaults like CSS blue. So instead of using a hex code, they actually typed in blue, and this is the color that appears. Also a fun fact, they're using Arial, Arial is one of the few system fonts. A system font is a font that you can find on all computers. It's one of the few system fonts that was co-designed by a woman. So this font was designed by Patricia Saunders for IBM in the early 1980s. This is also why we use Arial in this book and Arial Narrow. Arial Narrow in this book, Arial on the website. So our website. So this green blur snaps to what appears to be a fairly straightforward table but upon interaction, it's made to feel unusual. As you select, whether intuitively or intentionally, those are added to the side panel, which we call the trail, which you can then download as your own PDF and print as you'd need like. We don't store any of your selections on the back end, nor your IP. We only store the timestamp and the number of entries selected. So in some ways, this is quite anonymized, but it's really fascinating to see how many people are collecting entries in certain moments. Okay, so the third container is this book. So that website, as mentioned, we designed in a way to have some perpetuity. Um, 
that will continue to crowdsource entries for as long as possible. So you can go on cyberfeminismindex.com now, go to submit, and select your own works, the work of your peers or historical references, and then we will moderate them and apply them or include them accordingly. But you can also um, create your own reader. When we were creating this reader or snapshot, we basically froze the website at a particular point in time and edited it for about six months in Google Docs with my amazing collaborator, Andrew Scheinman, um, and color-coded the entire thing. So you have red titles, green metadata, blue annotations. Right now you see the cursor of Lily Healy. So Laura Combs is one of my best friends, also co-designed this book, and we hired Lily Healy, who scripts every weekly issue of The New Yorker because that magazine is highly templated and they have a lot of textual content. So Lily created for us a script. She's downloading the manuscript as an XML, and when she's pulling that into this InDesign document, it appears to be blank, but Laura preloaded it with character styles, object styles, paragraph styles, grids and guides, et cetera. So what you see is, as she drags it in, it seems to magically populate about 400 pages of this book. So about this much of this book was scripted using the script you just saw. However, <laughs> if only it was that easy. <laughs> um, so you can see that it's 400 pages of flowing columns, which means every time you add an image or a caption, you make a hard break, you typeset and get rid of a widow it pushes all subsequent columns across every other <laughs> following page. So we actually found that it was faster. If we found some sort of error, we would actually just rescript the entire thing. We would edit it in Google Docs and rescript it. Um, every single page style that you see is in a different script. So our pull quotes, our full bleed images, image grid, captions, all of those are different scripts that we then collated. I think what this goes to show is even as you try to make efficient, seamless technological systems, they often require an invisible, very manual human hand, and those two things work in collaboration for months and months and months. So even as we put all these things, we still ended up editing this for a few months in layout before we went to print. The last thing I want to talk about was the fourth container, which I really consider this setup. Um, it's gotten very beat up. There's red tape on here now, but again, we're embracing the glitch. But I then asked my good friend, Tommy Martinez, to help me create an interface out of this book to show the liveness of these artifacts, as this is bugging out, within the static images of this book. So what we did is, we created an AR app that lives on my computer using Unity, which is a gaming engine. And I'll kind of walk you through how that works. So, you have an image. Within the PDF, you select a 500 by 500 pixel frame of the highest fidelity, or the part with the most contrast away from the gutter, because this always gets warped. So then we have something like this. But again, if only it was that easy. So sometimes the images targets worked great. The camera's constantly scanning. You can see them pop up. Other times we have moments where I really wanted a video to play for Mary Magic's work. So even though this image appears to have a lot of contrast with our eyes, it actually doesn't have, sorry, this target is very sensitive. Um, it actually doesn't have that much to, to distinguish itself, maybe some circles, but the details are actually quite small. So what we did instead was we attached the target to this page, because a human is going to relate these two even if this video is related to this piece. But if I move Mary's piece, that target still works. It just kind of floats by himself. Another bug that we ran into 
was, again, with contrast. So this is a great piece still from Shu Li Chang's IKU, which is a sci-fi porn film that takes off where Blade Runner left off. Um, <laughs> Now, in 2023, she has released the sequel for this called UKI, and it's starting to premiere in some museums, so definitely keep an eye out for that. When we look at this page, it feels there's like there's two halves, but if you look at it tonally in terms of gray hues, it's pretty flat. So no matter where we put the target, it just could not scan. So this is why we added something called a key press. So this is the trailer for Shuli Chang's IKU. A key press is a video that I can place in certain parts of the screen, but just plays regardless of the book. But this was actually quite helpful because when we were, all of these thumbnails have image targets, but they just never scan. So what we do instead is I have a script where I know like how to turn things on. I'm kind of sharing all of this with you because I feel like some of the magic behind these technological systems is really a manipulation or a subversion of how tools are meant to be used. So unities are meant for games, but you can have it make a book into an interface. Um, so I think it's a way to encourage using the tools that we have now, whether it's a spreadsheet or unity, you can make that into the tool you need it to be rather than just using it in a predetermined way. All this said, I'd like to close with the acknowledgements. So this is our title sequence. You typically see these in films, but I think it goes to show the huge network of people that made a project like this and most books possible. So these are all the people that really focus on the infrastructural side, um, but also the people for the front and back matter and all the collections, the authors of those. What we see in the referred by, these are all of the people who I first called when I was building that initial spreadsheet. So these are the people that helped lay the foundation. And then I put this spreadsheet online and asked for any edits or annotations or submissions. And these are all the people that it submitted through cyberfeminismindex.com, which makes up about 60 to 65% of this book. And all of their names are attributed in the entries that they submitted. People have asked, and Laura and I have, were really questioning if this is a co-authored and very cacophonous volume, why is my name on the cover? Um, so we went back and forth on this a lot, and when we were doing some research for formal references, things like phone books, encyclopedias, but also textbooks, compendiums, et cetera, we found that the byline is often invisible and or hidden away. So what this suggests is the volume you're looking at is almost projected as an objective truth or a singular history. It doesn't need an author. This is the truth that we're seeing. By trying to really highlight an authoring editor, it was a way of saying this is a compendium, yes. There's over 600 pages in this book, but it's also trying to embrace and acknowledge that this was though crowdsource, very much uh, framed by my own subjective bias. There have been other compendiums of cyber feminism from the 90s, early aughts, and et cetera. So not only does it give someone to celebrate or point to, it also really gives someone to blame. So I have gotten so many emails about mistakes, remove me from the index, please add me to the index. And I think that this is why having an authoring editor is important because the rules of moderation were created by myself, even if implemented by other stewards. And that's something that we got to get a glimpse of in Natalie's talk, right? Like when you're kind of slotting people into these kinds of umbrellas, what does that actually mean if it feels like a bit of a misidentification, but maybe the best term we have now within today's context? I wanna end by saying that cyber feminism is a very imperfect umbrella term, which I illustrate and talk about in the intro. There are so many different strands of this, like 
Glitch Feminism, Legacy Russell's book in the back, Xeno Feminism from the UK. In Korea, it's Net Femmes. In Latin America, it's Hack Feminista. I put these under the umbrella of cyber feminism to show that there's a lot of resonance between them, but only because cyber feminism is a term that we can easily connote, even if you're a beginner, cyber and feminism. But that doesn't mean that they ne would necessarily identify with this space. Um, again, it goes back to that feedback loop. So for me, the rules of moderation were, how do you disseminate feminism using technology while also being critical of that technology through its use. So those, both of those strands are important. So for me, a hashtag Me Too is not cyber feminism, because it's not critical of technology necessarily. All of this said, I think we're gonna move into a Q&A, but thank you so much. I'm excited for the discussion. Thank you. Definitely um, a lot to take in, right? <laughs> and an incredible presentation. Um, that I think the, the principal word that connects the feeling between uh, what you both offered us is exciting. Mm -hmm. Like just dynamic and really, really exciting. Um, and it was really, um, thank you. So interesting for uh, us to all see the parallels between what you were offering in this question of categorization um, this question of like Natalie Panning is is not and cyber feminism is it is not and um, I think one of the the things that becomes really um, interesting in what you both do is not offer us a categorization um, of either the term or, or of your work but instead um, sit with like a questioning even in the, the, the scenarios that you offered us, like a, a deep questioning even of your own um, response to each scene. Um, and I think in, in the um, Cyber Feminist Index, dealing with the imperfect categorization or umbrella. Um, and yeah, I, th I think I'm just sitting with that a, a, a lot. Um, in terms of thinking with and through the complexity of these definitions, um, I think to you, Mindy, how has, since this, this um, project originated in around 2018, how has it morphed already for you? So not only has the project changed a lot in form, it's really allowed me to trace the different generations of this, especially as the internet is becoming adopted in different regions at different times. So in the beginning, you have a lot of provocative language. We have a lot of net art. It's very browser-based. This changes into a, a bigger publishing practice with the rise of like Web 2.0. Um, we also start to see this major criticism of platform oligopolies and how that's restricting the way we behave in online spaces. And then as we move into this very tumultuous Web3 moment, um, Cornelia Solfrank says that we've kind of segued into this cyber feminism has shifted towards ecology and economy. The internet has felt become quite ubiquitous. Like it's no longer restricted to the screen. It's around us at all times. Legacy Russell calls this AFK, away from keyboard, rather than IRL and URL. So I feel like trying to map these things, it doesn't feel like a branching tree. It does feel like almost a spider web. There's no clear origin um, or like a decentralized network of sorts. So that I think has been really exciting, but also has made me cautious because it's difficult to relegate certain things under this phrase because of this idea of self-identification, right? So I think that what I appreciate about the term is this constant emphasis on allowing the mutating definition and encouraging self-identification. Because even feminism has kind of a dirty word. You know, there's a lot of history, some people, it makes people cringe in some ways. But I think if you're able to trace a specific lineage of feminism that relates to you, 
then it feels like it's very accessible because this is just understanding how a patriarchal system impacts society. It's not only about men and women, which is very reductive. So I think that understanding a clear definition helps you define or create new terms. And that for me seems really promising. And I think also for you, Natalie, just seeing the, the, the mutation of our conversation around uh, Afrofuturism yesterday and even today, um, thinking about, um, I start thinking about how your work might feel or sit within cyber feminism and your relationship then to that word. Does it feel like a home? Does it feel like a, a, a container? Yeah, I think, um, is it? Yeah, it is on. I think um, it feels like a space I would love to learn from. It feels like a space that, that would like enrich my practice. And it feels like a space that could like feed me because I spoke a lot about like the practicing with, and a lot of the practicing comes without this like academic knowledge or also not wanting to feed too much into my practice academically, like really wanting to make sure that it's like separated from that. But then I'm also ready and open to like be fed and learn and have that moment be isolated from the practice. And so yeah, it definitely feels really nice to know there's like a home where I could like find everything, well, not everything, but I could find a huge chunk to like sit on and think into that could like lead me to even more like to know that there's a specific rabbit hole that I can jump into to allow me to like expand is like something I think is great for like an artist like me, but then also it's amazing that it's like available for all of us yeah. and it's so accessible. Because as long as it's online, as long as we have data, it's like there for us. So it's a great, it's such a great, great thing. Yeah, well done. <laughs> <laughs> Likewise. But I also, so I wanna, un I think when I was watching your performance, I was like, mate, why, let's, the act of like trying to unpack publicly why these terms don't feel quite right is so vulnerable. You're not criticizing them, you're just wondering like, why am I being categorized this way? And I think that for something like Afrofuturism, maybe the initial bristle comes from, if a curator's reading the work in terms of African and tech, that's a very reductive read. So if those are the primary definitions for Afrofuturism, then it makes sense to kind of push back from that kind of siloing. Martine Sims wrote the mundane Afrofuturist manifesto, which is a criticism of why you're allocating people into Afrofuturism category. Um, but I just, I do wonder like what terms might feel really energizing for you. Like, Namagathere coined the term Afro-presentism rather than focusing on futures. You've spoken a lot about digital art and like utopia or like luckiness. So even like digital utopian, like it doesn't even have to include certain prefixes. Mm. So yeah, I wonder, not that you have to answer now, but as a yeah. thought experiment. But we also spoke about. about this yesterday, Danny, when I was just like, I don't know if I want to put a term on it for a really long time, yeah. but I would love to keep using words mm -hmm. as I like move through creating the term yeah. and like finding a way to use those words to map me to a possible new word or just to the place that's always existed and to finally feel like I can actually call myself this thing. Yeah. And so it's like, this is like why I'm obsessed with this word. Like I said, the practice is like the best word to talk about us because it's like the practice, the ability to like keep fumbling and finding it. And when you're ready and you feel like it's not practice and it's something else, then speaking. And so like trying to find a way to move beyond the doing and then the consolidating. Yeah. So yeah, I think definitely, uh, did I, uh, I said, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, think, I think I've also been finding practice quite an energizing term because practice invites, it doesn't have to be perfect, it doesn't have to be like everything neat and in a row and figured out and, and presentational, but it can be a, like a c consistent rehearsal. Um, feels like a, an exciting way of thinking and maybe a less daunting and less 
patriarchal formulation of, of um, what it is to do work that is public facing in different ways, whether it be putting together an index that's got to live and breathe without you or putting you know, work out into the world, both of, of which are very vulnerable. So I think practice leads us somewhere interesting, but I think in dialogue with our conversation yesterday, also there's this uh, way of um, that you were speaking about talking about your work when you might not be ready to have articulations. Um, you know, work and practices being very often can be intuition-led, um, and then having to language and articulate it, um, and and being concerned about the fixedness of language. Like, if I say my work is this today, am I fixed to that, or is it allowed to kind of mutate over time? Yeah. Um, and I think that that becomes an interesting thing because the index has has built that in to what it is that it it does mutate and and live in, in, in different ways. Um, and um, I think the direction that I'd like to go in is, is you know, part of the, um, the reason for the tour and traveling is inviting all these different areas from different places. Um, and I start to wonder, and maybe it's not even a question that has a direct answer right now, but like what it means to think the cyber, uh, cyber feminists index from here? Like, what are the different ways that being placed here, located here, offers something different to the index? And I think we start to arrive at a little bit of that with what you offered with, with Tabitha Rizé's work and, and framing, and then what you offered with, with even thinking about Molly Soda and how you arrive post-post. It's giving Spider-Man. <laughs> so trying to understand how we ended up where we are. Hmm. Ooh. Well, I kind of like the idea that... Hmm. <laughs> yeah. I kind of want to... like fixate on this idea of practice, because even with the index, we call it a living index, because it's not like ending up where we are now. We're trying to like set some stepping stones for how it can continue to grow and evolve in the future, um, even with a lot of present practice and like action towards it. So I think for me, why well, I always talk about this, uh, the, this author, Ursula K. Le Guin, another science fiction author, she wrote this essay called A Carrier Bag Theory of Fiction, in which she posits that the first tool is not the spear, which is a tool of domination, but rather the, the basket, which is a tool of communion. So this does a few things. It, it reframes our history of technology away from only a digital connotation, like even a basket is a technology, it also changes our idea of uh, the protagonist away from the individual hero towards a collective, from a he to a we. So even when I was talking about the different containers of this project, it's referring to that essay. So this is an example of material gathering, gathering disparate objects, but it's also led to social gatherings, which is also a huge part of communion. So I think for me, like how we've ended up here, where we're going further is the activation and discussion that can lead to additional entries, but also continue to allow for change. Mm -hmm. um, so I like this, like, I like being asked a question, like where did Afrofuturism, who defined it, how was it mutated, who's been categorized or miscategorized like this? Like this for me keeps this very fresh because it's been four to five years of work. <laughs> so I think that for me is the most exciting part. Yeah. And I think we do, we do land in a different place when we think about um, the basket and idea of the containers. So the, the Cyber Feminist Index being a website spreadsheet and publication and all of those being different containers. Um, and then the importance 
then of gathering as a methodology and modality to this kind of work because then, you know, we saw the, the end credits, which looked like a movie. Yeah. Um, but it was like this, this way of, of evidencing and visibilizing just how much work goes into that. And, I've, and I think in thinking about uh, this idea of the basket and container, I'm starting to wonder how that can work even in thinking about your artwork mm. and which are the, the kind of baskets that, that allow uh, a, a, a mode of gathering references, gathering thoughts, gathering theories, gathering ideas, gathering yourself mm -hmm. um, in this work as a way of, you know, finding, mm. finding yourself, locating yourself. Oh, I love, love, love this question and I love the idea of like the basket as technology and it's also something that I've been talking about like with this work also in the back, like always focusing on the head and like the head always being present in the artwork because for me the head feels like the memory bank, the computer, yeah. the space of memory, like uh, that's a memory bank, but like the space where things are happening mm -hmm. and, and the body holding and so like thinking about that in this way where that's technology and I am constantly trying to articulate through showing my head but also like through like taking my head off my body and presenting it as just an object in space yeah. that the head holds these things, it holds a presence but it holds like universes, it holds like thoughts, um, it holds sensitivity um, and it holds the practice and it can just be taken off and like isolated. And so in that way, when it's like just a 3D sculpture, for me that feels like technology. Um, the specific work at the back, like the, the bust is like a 3D print and you can see like every single triangle when you think about like the fact that like this is made of like a million, billion triangles and that already like it's plastic but it feels like technology for me because it was created with so many like technological like tools and ideas and executions and then as just like a plastic object for me it feels like it represents a technology but also it sits as a technology within a space even though it has no button and activation you know and like what it like points to is also another form of technology which is like my head which is like literally always overheating <laughs> and it's just a great way to like make these connections um, without having to say it. It can just feel like something that represents like the physicality of a being, a black woman, me, or all these other things. And for me, that's actually what's happening when I'm thinking through these things. But it's also nice to have like the surface level, but then think through everything as technology, but play with like the duality of like what's technology and then what it is, which is just like it's a head and it's a real head and then it's not a real head and it's yeah. plastic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and even seeing in your PowerPoint presentation, many of the slides were these network graphs. Mm -hmm. So that also shows like a certain connectivity. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Like also trying to think like a computer because of so much computer usage and like being so used to things working in indexes but not realizing it in our brains like dipping in between so many of these formats and then trying to find a way to just like only be human but it's like no there's actually no way and it's actually all connecting and it's like jumping into the screen jumping out of the screen but like you're carrying these systems with you all the time and it's just yeah like so these are the thoughts through like the way you present yourself also, not just through the way we like present our work and through the way we speak. Like the fact that like my brain can hold so much TikTok, it's like, yes, it's from my phone. It's from the phone. So it's like, how does this object sit here? And how does this object take a video and put it back on this? And how does that move all around the world? And so it's just like the technology is always moving. And even if you have none on you, you are like about to yeah. put it into that space. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. This kind of reminds me of like this distinction between anthropomorphism, which is pretend connecting all of these things to the human, anthro, morph, 
versus technomorphism, which is, I don't know if it's a new word, but Salman Basser uses it to talk about this connection to technology. So humans acting as chatbots, mm -hmm. or like this constant like, behavioral shift that we're doing. A lot of this is starting to mimic a lot of the technological systems that we're using, as we also see technological systems mimicking human behavior. So it's very intertwined. Yeah, and I think that, uh, you know, there's two thoughts that I have, because I think it's very rich what you're offering what you're offering us, but the first is that, you know, when we were curating the exhibition that you see behind you, it was this idea of going inside your mind, inside your practice, but really getting into your headspace, and this index feels like going inside yours, mm -hmm. and really going down this, 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 I like the term rabbit hole, because that's how the internet yeah. um, feels very much, or like a different kind of infinite scroll. Um, that we are engaging in, um, but you know, our conversation takes me back to what you were saying about cybernetics, this idea of uh, you impact a system and the system impacts you. Um, and a while ago I used to collect books and put them on a shelf that I called the internet and what it's doing. <laughs> and I just, I don't think I ever got around to reading one of them, but I just collected them um, in a kind of, interest but also slight panic um, amidst it all because I think that the, you know, we, we constantly have all of these questions as we become just more technologically immersed and it's fun um, and, you know, we get into endless conversations about the TikTok of it all um, but at the same time, you know, you start to view and see all these different ways that your mind is shifting and changing and, you know, little things like, you know, turning on Netflix and being like, this is taking too long, I need a 15 second video that we can keep moving and just starting to think about attention spans. Um, so there's like a behavioral mechanism, but there's also a systemic political mechanism that you start to think about and yeah. in a world of like uh, chat GPT um, and in a world where uh, AI is becoming more human but watching NPCs on TikTok, watching humans be AIs is fascinating yeah. um, that all of this is happening at the same time um, and I guess and there's a question in there for me about how are you thinking about the use of technology in your own work and practice and the impact and conversations that you're having just in your own worldscape? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I said it several times in the talk, but I really like this idea of it's not about the tool, it's about how the tool is used. But it's important to recognize why we're using tools in certain ways and why the misuse is actually harder than we might think. So to what you just said, there's always this example of like, you can use a broom as a broom to sweep, you can flip it upside down and break a window in an act of protest, a misuse of the tool, but regardless of how you used it, it changes the shape of the hand. It's changed our physical body. And that's what we're seeing with TikTok or any of these online spaces. Um, but even with like this conversation around AI anxiety, I hear this all the time from students and colleagues and et cetera. AI itself is not actually a threat. The use of AI in today's context is threatening because we've seen that if AI becomes more intelligent than us, well, more intelligent systems humans to other species, has been shown to only go towards extraction and domination. So our instinct is like, if it becomes more intelligent than us, it will do the same to us. Um, or, because we're obsessed with efficiency and productivity and et cetera, all of these moments of respite that might, create, that might be created through the implementation of AI will just be filled with more and more labor. So, I think this is the thing that we have to be focusing our attention on, rather than AI itself. Like it's, yeah. I mean, there's problems with AI itself too, like the data sets and things, but that's a different point, yeah. 
Um, like using technology, I I think it's it's like using a teaspoon at this point. Like it's it's so in the world, it's yeah. so in the everyday function, and it serves its function according to the needs that come about. And so I don't have like a I feel like there's when I like I was born and there was TV and so if there was TV there was technology and there were all these things and these things that like made life easier and there was computers and in school there was computers and so I just I don't see a separation and I just see it as like yeah technology a teaspoon is a technology and all the other technology is also technology so I feel like I'm just kind of navigating all the tech that we have in our sphere um, on a daily and just trying to figure out like the balance, what's healthy, what's not. Um, it is interesting to now have to engage with the technology being aware because a teaspoon's not aware you know, of me or it just serves this function and it's like very clear. So to watch something like again, morph, change, yeah. um, advance while you knew it as one thing at some point and now it's like constantly growing like forces you to grow mm -hmm. just as fast as it's advancing mm -hmm. and also i think something i face now is more like feeling i mean we always feel like this as humans that like it's way more advanced than us but sometimes as like an artist or somebody trying to use the tools to better and like when there's more tools and it's just like feeling behind and feeling like you're not using all of them and you're not where you should be with them and just trying to find the balance between that. Yeah. But yeah, so I don't have a, a great answer. I just know that like it's an existence that is happening constantly and trying to figure out. Mm -hmm. And I think these are more open-based questions, yeah. not about the kind of Def definite arrivals, but mm -hmm. about the kind of provocations that happen when we're in this space. And I think you led us um, in a really, both of you led us in this really great way of thinking tool and thinking context uh, yeah. simultaneously. Um, and yeah, in the spirit of, of opening this up, uh, I'd like to take a round of questions. I'm sure people have them. Okay, one there. Do we have any more in the back? Okay, well, s two. A third. <laughs> okay, we'll go with these first two. Oh, microphone. Hi. Hi, guys. Hi, lovely panelists. Um, I feel really grateful to be um, hearing and experiencing your guys' cut and take and... Um, also expression of effort of the things that you care about and work on. So like, that's my first thing is like the, the gratitude of being able to like sit with um, the absolute geektation, the geekification <laughs> that's, being, that's taking place um, in these practices that we've seen today, which I think is really dope, really cool. And um, I have a habit of um, finding the personal within the work because I really care about the work forces that it takes, the almost miraculous levels of um, effort and continuous um, exertion of the self that it takes to create something that is so beneficial that it touches many others than the original self who prompted the idea. So, I know you. <laughs> So um, I'm going to ask you, Mindy, um, we've spoken about context, um, you guys have given several floors and rooms um, and ways to navigate um, that have been so open and community-based or like we-based, but I'm, I'm curious about how you have found yourself, um, what your canon events looked like, <laughs> yes, TikTok, um, but yeah, like what your canon events might have been, and um, if you're really hearing the question, you might feel how personal this is, so I will disclaim that like, you do not have to answer this as deeply as the question like almost like declares you do, but yeah, like where, 
like how did Mindy like come to do this stuff? Did it come from um, a desire to kind of rectify a record? Is it an archival conquest? Is it um, a personal interest? Is it um, I, I, I want to hold and gather? And this is how I make, and this is how I hack and yak. Like, mm -hmm. you know, like, not where is Mindy, but more like, not where is Mindy in this, because you're in all of it and none of it, which is, I feel like, like the way that you spoke about the authorship is so interesting and deserves its own book. Mm -hmm. So get on that one, that was so cool. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like, if you had to work on a non-linear timeline and work through it in a room full of strangers, like, how does that look? How did you come to it? In a simple way, like, yeah. what, like, brought you to, like, thinking about making this book? Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Hmm, wow. <laughs> that's, a, that's a beautiful question. Um, I think maybe it's obviously a mix of things. I grew up online. Like, I mean, I experienced dial-up and all this, but, like, I learned how to code when I was before school because I was customizing MySpace and like blogging on Zanga and bookmarking on Delicious. Like these online communities were very much part of how I kind of raised myself and met a lot of internet friends. Um, but I think in those spaces, you also learn that like with a certain level of anonymity or like pseudonymity, you get pigeonholed. Like you, the behaviors that we have in real life enter digital space, regardless of what your avatar looks like. And I think, I'll say predators, <laughs> are able to kind of pick these up and like push them back at you in a certain way, which was a really disturbing thing to learn when you're so young. But I think also as I entered like schooling years, I also realized like what a beautiful thing like social software is. Right, like I learned how to code because my professor would bring in physical boxes and like show us how nested boxes show box models. Or like we would make different types of networks using thread, like people in a room holding pieces of thread. So these are things that I was so excited by and it's just not, you don't find it very easily. So I think this social software idea for me was like, I see my peers doing this, I've experienced this. There is a sort of joyful way to learn about these spaces, even if the current understanding is very dystopic and disillusioned, understandably. Um, so I think that led to an interest in the content. In terms of the form, I think because my background is in design, I had a lot of peers that were so formally engaged. Like they got so much pleasure and like rigor from making the perfect new typeface or some new graphic style. And I always felt really bad about myself because I didn't like doing those things and I wasn't very good at them. So then I began to question like, what, is, what do I actually like doing? And I realized it wasn't about making some formal evolution, it was instead, creating the thing that makes the thing. <laughs> the Astro Gate says this, do you wanna make the thing or do you wanna make the thing that makes the thing? So I think for me it was like, oh, I can make platforms and containers and print on demand tools and indexes and collect these things together. And it still shows a form of creativity and authorship, but it doesn't, it's not a completely new graphic form. Like this is where I see a lot of Natalie's work, which is why I'm drawn to it but I can't make work like Natalie's. And I think instead of seeing it as like, well, you're a better artist and you're not a good artist, it's instead like, what is the thing that inspires an obsessive rigor? And for me, it's like, oh, I really like making lists, organizing them and <laughs> talking to people. How do those things converge in a creative way? And I think you would have a different set of things and it converges in a different visual output. So they're both visual, but just in a different types of structure. So I think that is something that I also try to tell to students too, because there's so much anxiety about trying to be the next new artist with the next new form. And I don't know if that's the right propeller for why we should be making these things. Um, but yeah, a little bit of obsession goes a long way. <laughs> Yeah. 
Exactly. Yeah. Practice, right? It's all a process and a practice. Yeah. How's it? Hi. <laughs> um, thank you so much to Mindy and Danny and Natalie so much for this incredibly whoa conversation. I think um, um, I'm a poet, so I'm really obsessed about language and in listening to Natalie's presentation specifically around Afrofuturism, I was thinking about Nnedi Okorafor, who, um, who's a science fiction, speculative fiction sort of writer, who made the distinction between Afrofuturism um, and African futurism, which is like, I think, a interesting, but also like, um, sort of like finicky um, way, but I think that there's a profound difference. My question, I think, is around death. Um, and around rot, when you were talking about like website rot and um, and death, I was thinking about in 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 a feminist sort of vein and an African feminist sort of vein. Like, how do we think about collective ways of grieving and mourning website rot, website death? Um, and if you have anyone on, on the panel, because I think all of you are brilliant and hot, that I think it would be really cool <laughs> to think about um, collective as well as like individual rituals of, of like mourning. I don't think we think about um, cyberspaces, because I, I was raised um, in like the Tumblr era, but before then like the MSN era, and even for, before that the Mixit era. Um, and and there's, a, there's a kind of like, open wound somewhere there around death and change that I don't think we've collectively thought about, like how to, how to grieve together. Like, are there such a thing as cyber funerals? <laughs> like, I'd love to hear your thoughts. What a special question. Yeah. So deep also, because I'm just like, wow, like the girl I was on Mixed is so different to the girl I was on Instagram. And the girl I was on Instagram last year is so different to the girl I'm on, like the girl I'm on Instagram now and the girl I'm on TikTok. Yeah. Like, what? Is it death? Is it regeneration? Is it like phoenixing into something else? Um, but I think, yeah, like, I have no answer, actually, because it's such, like, now I'm going to ask myself that question, but I think that it is such a beautiful thing that you've, like, brought to us and made us think about. Um, I don't want it to sound like death, though. Like, I think death is, but it is, it is in many ways death, like, you know? So it's just like, uh, like, we just move on and we never think about the story. I also like remember like randomly now like so many stories like I found this very weird mix of community in South Africa who were writing like really really cute love stories all around like from different points of SA and then I randomly lost it and then like mix it was just not a thing for me anymore because I was just like what is the point and I don't know how I landed in this like wormhole so it's also interesting to think about but I have no I have no answer but what a beautiful question I'm just gonna sit with it yeah that is a very thought-provoking question um Hmm. Uh, <laughs> I don't even mean to say it in reference to your talk. I just keep, I mean, okay. Um, so death online is a really interesting question because immediately I was thinking, well, there is like this rise of like techno mysticism and techno shamanism. Like, is it related to that? But I think part of it is also link rot. When I was talking about it was when an old website dies. The average lifespan of a website is around 2.5 years, according to Forbes, which is very short. But I think another way to think about digital death is like when our device dies, all the content on that, in, if it's not backed up, goes with it. That's like a real sense of loss when you lose all of your photos or something like this. And it makes me think about I don't know about the grieving process, but I do think about what are ways of like kind of safeguarding this. Paul Soelis writes that downloading is political because we're in an era where we don't own any of our content locally. 
Everything is in the cloud. Everything is uploaded to a platform. When you upload something to Instagram, they're allowed to use that photo however they want. That's in their terms of service, but we just don't read or care. Um, but if we actually go out of our way to download what we want from the Cyber Feminism Index, take screenshots of whatever, have local, have photos stored on our local hard drive, printed, printing them out even. I feel like these are ways of like saying, oh, I'm actually being an active preservationist in what I think is important rather than certain companies telling me what should be saved. So like there are several digital preservation companies like the Internet Archive has a tool called the Wayback Machine. They essentially have bots that scrape every link on the open Internet twice a day and they have saved multiple snapshots of every website that has open permissions which is likely all of your websites. So on the one hand, it's kind of interesting to see like my portfolio site from 2013, but it's also, it's been done without any consent. Like maybe I want my website to die, but now there's this record of it, right? Um, on the other hand, Rhizome has a tool called Conifer where you save the sites that you think are important. So I go out of my way to like, archive Natalie's site because I want to save the dynamism or the JavaScript animations or et cetera. Um, so I think it's just making me question a lot about what preservation actually means and why it's actually okay if the majority of things online are not saved. I think that's good. <laughs> but I also think that means you need to do the saving or else someone's going to save it and tell you this was your history when it wasn't. So. Yeah, I think that was a really um, fascinatingly provocative question to bring yeah, into the space. Really nice. Because on one hand, it leads me to the question of the, the, the real ebb and f uh, flow of grief um, and sitting in that, that dynamic relationship to it. Um, on the other hand, um, it's the way that you speak about the person you are and these different now defunct platforms that I wonder if in some ways we can resurrect parts of them um, and I wonder what afterlives look like. Um, and on the other hand, in, it leaves me in the romance of nostalgia um, in that direction and how that can be a nice space to occupy and live in um, because of the way that memory works. Um, this has been a fascinating and incredible conversation and I would love for it to continue in a more social way. Um, thank you for all your time and your attention and your energy and your questions and your mmms and mmms. <laughs> I don't think we'll ever be able to hear that in the same way. Um, a reminder that the book is available outside and I would just like to invite our director, Dr. Victoria Collis butelezi to um, give the closing. Not closing, folks. Super thank you. <laughs> this, is, this is gratitude, right? I'm not going to do a closing because what you guys did is amazing uh, and I can't possibly match or top. So I'm going to say thank you to Nombuso Matibela for uh, the sonic offering. Danny, thank you for holding the program and facilitating this conversation. Natalie, uh, amazing. Um, Natalie Panang, uh, Mindy, Sue, amazing. Thank you both. Uh, thank all of you. Lapa, so Tammy Langtree, uh, thank you. Wait, I'm sleepy, so my eyes are getting, getting funny now. Okay, and sense of direction, sorry. Thank you um, for hosting us uh, for this event and so many others and being a holding space for RGC and the work that we do, being partners with us. Uh, thank you to Dr. Asma Diashete, head of the cultural programs team with Goethe Institute, to Dave and Visual Studio for the tech setup, Jonathan Ball, the South African distributor 
of the book Cyberfeminism, the Cyberfeminism Index, and to bridge books uh, where copies of the Cyberfeminism Index can be uh, accessed, purchased uh, in South Africa. I also want to just remind that we do have copies here this evening for sale. Of course, to the Breeze Block team for the amazing space and catering and love through food. Thank you to our funder, the National uh, Institute for Humanities and Social Sciences, who come through for us just about every time. And of course, the amazing and phenomenal RGC team, most especially James McDonald, Daniel Bola, and Nom Buso Matibela. Thank you to all of you for coming out and staying with us. I hope this has been sustaining, life-giving, wonderful, and changing in all the best ways. Good night. <laughs>